Lord God, we just thank you that we can come together, that we can come even from different homes and different locations and still because we each have the Ruch HaKodesh within us, we can each be knit together. We can come together in one mind, one heart, in that unity of spirits, lifting up our prayers and our praises to your holy throne at this very moment, thanking you that you are almighty God, thanking you that you are in control, thanking you that you are more powerful than anything this world could throw at us, thanking you that even when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us, your rod and your staff that comfort us. Thank you, Lord, that that comfort can be extended to the Ensman family and to the Pearl family and to others who knew Aaron. Lord, we pray for each one that knew him in their life that know you, that this does draw them closer to you, more on that walk of sanctification toward you that we all should be striving for. And Lord, I pray for the unsaved in his life, that it might be a motivator for them to want to know what the future holds that can only be found in a relationship with you. So use it to your glory, Lord. May you be honored in it. And wherever we are apart, Lord, may we shine for you because uh, that's our great joy is to be used of you and that people see you. As we open your word together now, may it bless and nourish and strengthen and fulfill the needs of each heart. Lord, bless each one for taking out time to come and to set apart the world. And to come into that that sweet focus with you. Thank you that you are here in our midst. And we give you glory forever and ever. In your precious and your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I trust again as yesterday that the Lord has put on my heart what will be a blessing to each one of you. I am reminded somebody had intended to be on, so I'm not sure what's happened. But I, like I said, I'm going to... Go ahead and move forward anyway. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, that's great. If you don't, I will. I'm opening up on my phone. So when you see me play with my phone, it's my Bible. <laughs> um, but I will um, be giving us a few verses um, that we can look at or you can just listen to. I guess ultimately, um, the thought, if I was trying to bring it like a title or something to this, it would be that uh, we are looking to the God of all comfort, that he is our comfort, that we can count on him, and that uh, he doesn't comfort us to be comfortable, but to comfort others, that there is work he requires of us, that uh, this isn't a time, especially because we're isolated. It's not a time to think, oh, well, we can take a break. You know, let's take 10 and we'll check back in later. This is a time to still be active for him, to move forward for him, to be strengthened in him, and to reach out to help others in whatever uh, opportunities the Lord does give us. Um, I don't know about you, but I've got a phone ministry. My short calls are now long calls. My long calls are now marathons because people are lonely. <laughs> people being isolated are looking for that out. And, you know, we each have the ability to reach out in different ways. And uh, especially it'd be a time for us personally to grow. Um, I know that we all go through different experiences at different times. And because I was dealing with those yesterday that were literally brokenhearted, Maybe that's why the Lord put this on my mind. And I start and draw from Tehillim, from Psalm chapter 34 and verse 18. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Um, I've heard from many different sources that there are those that are really struggling because of not being able to go to church. That, uh, you know, this has been a a lifeline for them and even though you know they're trying to zoom or whatever um it's just you know it's very difficult i think the christian spirit can be as simple as that and i don't mean simple in the wrong way but i mean it doesn't have to be a catastrophe or a tragedy like the, the family i'm dealing with it can be just whatever brings that person down in their spirit and that's not where the lord wants us nor what um, he, where he leads us if we, you know, turn to him. And that was my focus yesterday is to get each one of the, this, these families to be focusing on the Lord, not on our circumstances, but to focus on the Lord. 
and not to be afraid to cry out to the Lord. Let him know how we're feeling, what our needs are, where we are, because he, especially the Lord Yeshua, Jesus, taking on human form, understands the frailty of the human being that does get tired, that does get weary, that does get crushed in spirit, that needs um, the encouragement, that needs to not fear. And so uh, it's not anything to be ashamed of if these emotions come on us. It's what we do with these emotions. Do we stay there? Do we languish in it? Do we set up a pity party? Oh my, oh me. Or do we take them to the Lord and allow him to bring us that refreshment and that encouragement? If we look to the scriptures, we look to human beings. I, I love to, to try to make the people of the Bible as real to us as you and I are to each other today. You know, these were real people. These aren't storybooks. It's not fiction. It's not somebody's put some imagination down on paper. These are people that, you know, if we could go time travel and mix with them, they'd be like you and I. So we look to them to see how did they handle their circumstances. You know, we when we go through a hard time, we immediately want to reach out to someone that we know has gone through something similar. And we ask them, you know, what helped you? What what did you do to get through? What verses comforted you? You know, we want someone with experience. And we know our Lord has that experience. But again, I'm not my not knowing what you're facing, where you're um, level of need is. I want to bring a number of examples from people like you and me to us today to just encourage our hearts. A lot of times people deal with fear. I think fear is one of our biggest struggles as a human people. I think that's why the Lord gave 365 verses on do not fear, be not afraid. In some form, 365 times I'm told that have been counted in scripture. I'm going to take you to just one. I'm going to take you to Yeshua, Joshua, who uh, I look at as a great leader. He was uh, tutored under Moshe, but we even see uh, when Moshe would go out at least once, if not more than once, we see that Yeshua stayed in the tabernacle, in the meeting place with the Lord, stayed on his face before the Lord, and got his strength in the Lord. And I think that's what caused him to rise up to be such a great leader he given the joy of taking the children of Israel across into the promised land. But when that uh, mantle was being passed to him, when Moshe was going to be leaving him, and I think we can relate to that if you've had someone who's been a mentor in your life, someone who's been close to you, um, that, that you know you're being separated from, you, you're filling that void, and you're probably beginning to, to feel the, can I measure up? You know, can I fill those shoes? And of course, in ourselves, we cannot. But I think that Joshua knew what to do. He knew to cry out to the Lord. And we have recorded for us in Joshua 1 9 the answer that was given to Joshua. And if you want to open your, your Bible to that, that's one of the verses we will look at. I think it's one you may even know by memory. I think I do. But as soon as I try to quote it, I get myself into trouble. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. And my Bible reverted. So I'm calling it back up. Sorry. Joshua 1. Oh, it's there. Okay. And verse 9. And we read there. Have I not commanded you? Okay. If it's a commandment coming to Joshua, we know it's coming from the Lord God. That he's the one commanding Joshua. And so he's, I, I feel like he's saying, hey, you know, wake up here. You know what I've commanded you. And what has he commanded him? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. Okay, that's great. Anybody can tell you, well, be strong. You know, fuck up. Come on, be courageous. If he stopped right there, the verse honestly would have no value to to us today it might have value to joshua because he was facing firsthand and getting it from the lord but what does it say to us but it doesn't stop there i, I love the next part why should he be strong why should he be courageous why shouldn't he tremble why shouldn't he be dismayed there's one reason and one reason is all we need for whatever we're fearing and that is for the lord your god is with you 
wherever you go. And I don't know about you, but that makes my heart sing. It's like, okay, Lord, if I know you're going with me in this, you and I can get through this together. I never have to worry about the Lord saying, I'm going to leave you. You know, even when he physically left his town to be, he gave them the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, who indwelled them, which was even a stronger connection than he could be on the outside to them at the same time. And, you know, we're coming up to that time. Another week, we're going to be celebrating the coming of the Ruch HaKodesh. So it's timely to think about it. But I see, uh, again, in this, you know, the comfort that is ours. I don't care where you are. I don't care how many human beings in your life have walked away from you or left you, whether by choice or whether by force, whether by a tragedy or whether, you know, by just simple, you know, sometimes things come up and people have to move, whatever the reason, you never need fear that the Lord will not be with you in it. Joshua saw that, took that, led the children of Israel and is respected as a good leader in his, uh, in, in the pages of the scriptures that talk about him. So I use him for a great example for us, if that be our need. What about to the Israelites when they were slaves in Egypt? That could not be easy. Again, I want to make it think and not just read words on a page and go on. If you were living in slavery, You've got someone that's more than an eight to five boss over you. You've got someone who has your life or your death in their hands. Being slaves, they could be beaten to death at any moment in time. The ruler could be as ruthless as he wanted to be. And no one would advocate for that slave. No one could. They weren't in a position to be able to. And they suffered at the hands of the Egyptians. We know that. Their, their moaning and their groaning came up in the, the ears of God because they were so miserable, not because life was so pleasant. But we read in Shemot in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7 that God said, I am concerned about their suffering. That shows me a, a personal um, attention toward what we're dealing with. The Lord was concerned about their suffering. We know earlier he said he heard their groaning and their moaning and he raised them up the deliverer. He brought them, Moshe, who brought them out of Egypt. But there's something more being said in those words, I'm concerned about this one. Maybe again, I have to relate to it from where I am in my personal life right now. I hear the tragedy. I knew this young man just barely. So I'm not feeling the void. I'm not feeling the hurt and the pain. But I have a concern for my loved ones and his loved ones as they go through this time. And I relate that now to what the Lord is saying in these words. I'm concerned. I see a, a personal interest in those words and a uh, personal interest to connect and to help these people. That's what I'm trying to, to put a face on this for us today, that we have a God who is personally interested <clears throat> in us. He has a personal interest. On that note, we see him say to the widow who had lost her only son, don't cry. Now that could be very insensitive. You just lost your son, don't cry. You know, we hear that sometimes. People who've gone through the death of a loved one can tell you, and I think I'm preaching to the choir here. I think we've all experienced the loss of loved ones. You go, you will get um, Job's counselors and he'll get God's counselors. You get those who tell you, you know, get over it. They just don't seem to have it, the sympathy and the understanding. And you have the others who, because they've experienced it, know how to comfort and how to be there. And his purpose of telling her not to cry, and what this is, by the way, in Luke 7, if I didn't give that to you, Luke 7, 13, the purpose was because the son was going to be brought back to life. This was not the end here. There was hope in the picture, and there's always hope in our picture. He brought hope to those who otherwise it would be hopeless for. If you remember the time of the adulteress who was caught in the very act and brought before Yeshua for condemnation, did the Lord condemn her? We don't see that, do we? If you remember the story, and if you don't read it in John 8 later on your own, that we know that 
to this one who was not living an exemplary life, who was not in a right walk with the Lord, obviously, but we see him extend grace <laughs> and mercy to her. We see a love that looked past her circumstances. She, I'm sure it was a setup, you know, where is the man? Why wasn't he brought also? It takes two to be in that act, but you know, they were doing what they could to trip up the Lord and they had no care for this person. I can only imagine her life being pretty empty and pretty lonely on a normal basis. And here, rather than the Lord cast that first stone, he said, you know, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And I know that we don't know definitively what he wrote in the dirt, but I tend to think what he was writing because one by one, her accusers left. I think he may have been writing out the commandments that they were breaking. And that they knew he was calling them out. Oh, this one, this is the commandment you've broken. This one, you've done this. Showing us all that we none of us should come from a haughty position and, and thinking that we are all this and, and looking down on others or trying to trip the Lord up in his own uh, words to us. But he saw through it all and knew how to bring them to their knees also we see they leave they weren't willing to turn and repent apparently but she did because when he asked her you know where are your accusers and and there were none and he said i don't accuse you either but go and sin no more and we know this marked the change in her life that she had a personal encounter with the lord so what was meant to do her harm and was meant to do the harm harm to the lord we see turned out to bring a beautiful relationship out of it no matter where we come from. And I know you all are talking to other people also. I often will hear from the unsaved out in that world, you know, well, I, I need to clean myself up first. Uh, you know, I'm too bad to be loved. I'm, this is too bad. God couldn't, you know, overlook this. Well, you know, you're right. He can't overlook it, but he can forgive through the love of the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. So that's for all of us. If we're caught in our sin, Confess your sin and feel his forgiveness because he is faithful and just to forgive. And if we have that forgiveness, then exude that to others, sharing with them the way for them to also come into this love, this love that, that opened her eyes to a new life. And opening her eyes reminds me of the blind man that was longing to see. And Yeshua touched him, Luke 18, 42, said, receive your sight. And the reason why with this one and, and why I'm bringing this one out to you, because he, he gave sight to many, but this one recorded here in Luke 18, he said, your faith has healed you. He looked to Yeshua, Jesus, and faith believing. The same way I hear Martha say it to Yeshua, it, even if you ask now, my brother can live. She had faith in him. Our faith in our Lord is always rewarded. We'll never, um, what's the word I want? Never regret putting our faith in the Lord. We will never be put that to shame. We'll never be disappointed. He is our faithful one. And I'm so thankful because I can't measure up. But it's not me. It's faith in him. And that's what I, I want to encourage us to see. His disciples, his Talmudim, when he was leaving them, he's a friend now. He's, they've been walking with him three and a half years. I can imagine, you know, the feeling of, you know, I don't want this, this friend to leave. I don't know about you, but if I had a close relationship with someone for three and a half years and I, they're telling me they're going to go, I feel the heart pain. And I think that, that they were feeling that. That he told them, even though he was going, I will be with you even to the end of the age. He was not leaving them comfortless and he was not leaving them alone. And we know, you know, what followed again, the coming of the Ruch HaKodesh. But he also told them something that, that I don't see any reason why it should not put a bright spot in our futures. And that is what he tells them in Yochanan in John chapter 14 and verse 2. He said to those at that time, um, I am going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be with me also. I think that's pretty exciting that he is not absent from us without remembering us. 
he's absent from us, making a place for us that we can be with him forever. And that's hallelujah. I don't want to live here forever. I don't want to live in in where tragedy strikes and heartache comes. I want to live in his presence forever. And it excites me that he's preparing a place for each one of us. I wonder what our places look like. Does he take our individual tastes here and enhance them there or does he make it totally different you know we'll find out when we're home but have you ever watched that television program extreme uh, home makeover where they take a family that's living in, in a destitute situation a family that that has been voted on to be deserving of this and they take them out of their home usually demolish that home but what they put back in its place they've listened to the, the people before they send them off on a nice little vacation for a week and then they they know okay this one loves i happen to see part of one of the shows recently I hadn't seen it in years the little girl piano was her thing they ended up putting a piano in her bedroom they gave her a canopy that at the top of it had piano notes you know running across the top of her canopy. i mean she was in awe when she opened that door and saw her room and the fact that they had gotten to know her just a little bit and touched what was close to her. Well, remember who made you? He knows you even better than yourself. We'd spend our whole life getting to know ourselves. He knows us before we even came out of the womb of our mother. And I just, I, I ponder and I think, you know, for those of you who know me, you know that I love the rainbow because of the connection that I have with the Lord in it. And I picture my my little mansion. Now I picture rainbows all over heaven, and, and that's pearl theory, and I'll give that to you some other time. But I picture when he's making my place for me, that it's got to have rainbows. <laughs> it's got to have that reflection. Whatever it is that's in your mind, you know, again, when we get home, we'll find out whether we were right or not, and it's not going to matter because whatever he will make will be more glorious than anything this earth can offer us. But let it, for me, it just draws me more intimately with him. I feel more of that, um, that personal, you know, he knows me and he loves me. And I believe he gifted me with the rainbow. What's he gifted you with? What's he got between you and he? You know, Revelation, one of the churches was told that, that they'll be given a new name that just they and the Lord know. Others don't. It's between the two of them. And I feel that intimacy is is a higher level of uh, of of the relationship. That you, when you know someone intimately, then you can you know plan something for them, make something for them, enter in in that that special way that doesn't mean anything to anyone else, but to you and the one on the other end, it does. Again, because of the rainbow in my life, I made a little um, refrigerator magnet for my mom. And, you know, she and I were very close. She was my best friend as well as my mom. And it basically said a rainbow between two hearts. And it was mama one side and me on the other. And we treasured that. That little thing probably cost less than 50 cents. <laughs> but it was priceless. And that connection I feel with the Lord, it's priceless. I hope that each one of you has something like that with the Lord that you are drawing on in your mind right now. Lord, this is what's between you and me. And I picture this all over my place in heaven. I picture this because I see that you want me. And when I know that he wants me, when you know you're wanted and you know you're loved, it warms you somebody says from you know the cockles of your heart i think that means from the very depth of your heart and this is the one that when you're crushed in spirit remember how we started out broken hearted he's the one in fact there was a shop that my dad saw way back in his day um because we don't have them now we're a throwaway society now but this was one of those little fix-it shops that you would bring your your little things that would break in the house to this place and it said, the sign said, we can fix anything except a broken heart. But then they put up another sign below that. And they said, but we know the one who can fix the broken heart. And it was their way of being a testimony. And that's what, whether you feel broken hearted today or not, if you don't, praise God. 
that if you have or you do in the future, just know, even in the midst of that pain, you know the one who can fix that broken heart. You know the one who loves you so much that he tells you when you're going through deep waters, I'm with you. When you're going through the good days, I'm with you. No matter what life hands us, no matter what day comes, we don't need to succumb to our circumstances. We need to allow our circumstances to be stepping stones that cause us to climb up closer to the Lord. That's what he wants. And I think that's why he gives it to us in a parent-child relationship also, because he is that loving, perfect parent, not the parent that didn't know how to love or didn't you know, do something right or brought hurt, but he, he is that perfect parent knows how to give good gifts to his children, delights in giving good gifts to his children, knows how to comfort them, knows how to heal them, but also knows how to grow them. And that's why I want to bring us in our next step uh, in this thought is he doesn't do all this for us so that we can be at the, in the sunshine and everything's wonderful and we're, we're, we're of no earthly good because we're just slurpy. <laughs> <laughs> no, he requires of us also. He told the Talmudim, the, his disciples in Luke chapter 5 and verse 4, he told them, launch out into the deep. Get away from the shore, take that boat, go out into the deep. I can imagine the Talmudim thinking, are you kidding? You know, I don't remember the story right now if this was when they'd been out all night already and not caught anything, but if I remember correctly, it was. But we know that to be true anyway. And the thought being, we tend to want to stay where we feel safe and secure. We want to, to grasp hold of the shoreline. But if you stay on the shore, you never get to see the greater that is out there. You're, you're going to deprive yourself of what could be because again, you're dealing with that fear. Remember Joshua, don't fear. You know, he had to cross over into the promised land. If he held back on the shore and didn't take them into the promised land, he'd miss out on the blessing also. And when the Lord told his town of being, go out deep, go out to, deep, to the fish deep. I think we can take that and apply it to ourselves in the sense, are you launching out deep in the word of God? Have you let go of the shoreline? Are you willing to go out where it's not, your, your boat can rock. In the deep, the waves can come up. In the deep, you can't grab hold of the shoreline. Uh, when I was a little girl in a swimming pool, until I learned how to swim well, I would stay very close to where I could grab hold of the side of the pool for the safety and the security it was. I wouldn't go to the middle of the deep end until I felt secure. Well, he is our security. And we need to launch out because he wants to take us deep. If we go deep into the word of God, there is treasure there. You don't get that on the surface. Yes, you can get good on the surface, but we all know the deeper you go, the, the, the more precious are the jewels that are found. And we know that because of his atonement, do you realize how deep in the blood you went? Do you realize your depth in the blood? Do you realize how deep atonement is? It's over your head. It covers your whole body. It's, it's an overflowing depth that oozes into every nook and cranny, every fiber of your being. And in that place, you experience the depth, the joy of your salvation. That's where you get the illumination of the Holy Spirit. That's where you get the balm that, that is the balm of Gilead that feeds the soul. If you're feeling hungry, and I mean that by you're feeling a little bit low, discouraged, fearful, despondent, what you need is to launch out into the deep. That's just the time to say, Lord, push my boat out. Let the wind come up and take my boat out. Don't let me cling to what's just shallow. I want the depths. I want to go into the depths of the word of God. I want to go into the depths of his shed blood. I want to be in 
I want the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, to be able to take me in deeply. Because remember, let me take you to John 7. John 7, 37, I think, is a good place to go right now. And right on the heels of that, I want to take you, um, I think, into Psalm 1, if I don't forget. If I do, you can read it on your own. But John 7, I want to take you to 37, and I believe 38 also, at least 37. And this was Yeshua speaking, and, and I don't have time to give the Jewish background to it, which is amazing and awesome, the celebration of the time that it was. But on this last day of the great feast, Yeshua stood and he cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, anyone, I think we fit in that category. I think we're in anyone. <laughs> if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And yes, verse 38 is the key. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. Now the spirit hadn't yet been given, but in our day, the spirit has. And if out of the belly flows living water, I, I picture in my mind a spring of water that just keeps springing up and flowing the depths of the water. What does that water do? That water is refreshing. That water is satiating. That water is invigorating. When I climbed up to the waterfall um, in Engedi, where David hid in the caves by the waterfall, when you start up, they, they tell you, you'll hear the waterfall long before you'll see it. Well, by the time we finally get to it, you've trekked. It's hot. It's, it's, it's well worth it. Because when you get there and here's this whole waterfall just flowing and nothing's stopping it and you feel the coolness. You know why he hid in those caves there in the coolness of the desert and you just feel refreshed and renewed. And I, I pictured that this is the water that just flows out of, out of the, the belly, out of the, the heart, out of the, the, the very being. Why can it flow out? Because the Holy Spirit's within us. And as he flows out that living water, then let that now, Lord, be the depths of the water that I'm in so that it's not stormy water. It may be a storm that takes me there, but then it's the spirit of God that fills me there, that refreshes, and that's where it takes us. I am remembering the Psalm 1. What does water do for us? Uh, I think I want verse 3, but Psalm 1. And yes, verse 3. He will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in its season, its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. That's drinking from that well. That's being in the living water. That's close to the depths of the water. You know, a tree that is looking for water, the roots come up to the surface. That's why you'll see them break up sidewalks and why you'll see ground that's uneven because the tree is searching for water, it's spreading out its roots, looking for what it needs. But a tree that is well watered, the roots go down deep. The roots drink from the depth. And then mm -hmm. the water comes up and that tree is a tree that has green leaves. It bears fruit. It does what it was meant to do. And we even see in the picture of the temple that will be the holy temple of the Lord during the millennial time. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter um, 47, I think in particular, talks about the water, the water that comes from the throne. And at first it's to his ankles, then it's to his knees, then it's to his loins, and then it's water so deep to swim in. And the question I want to ask you is, how deep are you willing to go with the Lord? You know, he'll only take you where you'll allow him. He won't force you. He's not going to scare you, but he wants to take you. He doesn't want to stop at ankle deep water. He wants to take you in water that's deep enough to swim in. And when you're swimming in his water, you're swimming in the mercy and the grace of our Lord. You're not swimming in water that, that's, um, that is the storm and what's scaring you. Now you're in his water that's refreshing, renewing, fulfilling, satisfying. And it's in that that we realize how thankful we are that we let go of the shoreline because you won't trade those experiences with him for anything. If you have ever experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. And you'll say the next time, Lord, let's go, let's go. Let's let go land and let's go. Let's launch out into that deep. 
And, you know, we never need to fear our future because God's already there. He knows the future. He holds the future. He molds the future. So whatever, whether we're feeling how long will this isolation go on, Lord, or whether we're dealing with something far more serious, we've got a God who knows how to meet that need, who is there, who wants to meet it. He wants the water in your life not to overflow you, but the water to refresh you. When the waters are overflowing you, when you're feeling that they are that type of water, I take you to Isaiah 43. And in Isaiah 43, we're going to start with verse 2. When you pass through the waters, so they are troubled waters here. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Didn't we hear that before? Wasn't that what he told us earlier? And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Why? Verse 3, the start of it, for I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, I am your Savior. That's all we need to know. He's our Savior. Those waters won't be overflowing. They won't be treacherous. They won't be drowning waters. They will instead turn out to be the refreshing waters that will pour out of our soul, fill us up, satiate us, and carry us closer into his, the depths of his presence, into the wells of living water where we find those nuggets that are so precious to our soul, where we get into those intimate moments with our Lord, where we know that he's calling us by that personal name that he has with each one of us. And therein, we find the anchor to our soul, what will carry us, no matter our storm, what will uh, end up being for our good, the same way what Yosef could have laid down and given up and said, oh, oh, woe is me. I'm out of my land. I'm away from my family. I'm sold into slavery. And now I get put into prison when I didn't do anything wrong. If he'd had that attitude and if he'd stopped there, he would. the waters would have been overwhelming to him. But instead, in it, he trusted his God. He shined wherever he was planted. When he was the slave, he was the best slave. When he was in prison, he was the keeper of the prisoners. He was the one they turned to for answers. And in that, it ushered him from a chain around his ankle to a chain around his neck. And he comes into being second in the kingdom, comes to being living the life of a prince, comes to being the one who is able to save his very own family. What an amazing route took him through that. Look, his fellow man meant for evil. God meant for good. So may it encourage you and strengthen you, whether you're in storms that are man's doing to you, whether you're in storms in your own mind, from yourself, from your circumstances, it, just look at the word of God. One of these examples has got to touch you. Someone that I shared something about at this point has to relate to you. And if it doesn't, then ask the Lord to show you where in scripture it does, because I don't think you'll experience anything that something in scripture won't relate to that. I think the Lord covered it all in the books that he gave us. And we know, again, though, these, yes, these were real people, real circumstances. Let us understand, what if the Lord were writing the Bible today? We would be those people. We would be those examples. That's what he did. Real people, real examples, real life stories. And we don't see a one of them lost, do we? Any that were the Lord's, were the Lord's to the end. Even if the, the body suffers death the soul is immediately with the lord so i trust this has been an encouragement and uplift and a feeding of your soul may you take it and make it your own get into the scriptures that i gave you or scriptures that are touching you where you are right now and draw from that well draw get into the depth get take it deep launch out and oh by the way remember when they launched out into the deep that's when they were overloaded with the fish. There was so much that the nets were even breaking. They couldn't bring it in. God's provision, abundant, above all 
that we could ask or think. And in fact, let me take you to that, that verse in closing, that's Ephesians 3. Let me take you there real quick. We've got a couple minutes. I love to do this with this verse. If you've never done this, this verse has so many adjectives or adverbs or whatever they are, you know, one on top of the other, all these superlatives that sometimes we remember it, we quote it, we stop thinking about it in the depth that I think that we should see here. So we need to read this verse. The first word is verse 20. The first word is now. Stop right there. Now. <laughs> this is for now. This isn't for tomorrow. This wasn't for yesterday and we missed it. This is for now. Um, do we all have a now? <laughs> I think we do. We all have a now, don't we? We know what now means. Now, to him who is able. I'm going to stop you shorter than that. I'm going to take you just to the two words next. Now to him. Stop right there and focus. Okay, it's for now. And now to him, to the Lord. Okay, to the Lord. Whoops, I just sent my Bible back to the other verse. Okay, well, I know as I'm looking it up again, now to him who is able. We're not asking just anybody. We're not asking someone that we hope can help us. Thankfully, the Lord has put people in my life to help me where I am weak. I'm looking at one of them right now. Eddie, that's you. <laughs> Eddie is strength, and he is strength with a heart. He will do what, what I ask him to do. I have to worry that he'll overdo. I have to, to wonder if I'm mistreating him. You know, where was he coming from? Was this a good time? That's because he will never say no. And he will never quit. When he and Roger especially were helping move my house. And Roger, you're another one in this. I'm picking on you too. Because <laughs> you're another one with that kind of a heart and strength. But Roger knew his strength was wearing out. And he told me, he said, man, he said, when I couldn't be Eddie's equal, Eddie just picked it up and did it. <laughs> you know, that's shallow compared to my god my god is so able well how able is he let's read it he is able to do far more okay beyond what i'm asking <laughs> beyond eddie i need help moving something roger pick up the other hand beyond that he is able he is able to do far more abundantly I've got, I'm sorry, my my computer screen has come up and it's given me a, a message and there we go. I didn't want it in your faces and I forget that it's not a touch screen. <laughs> so I was trying to touch the screen. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the focus. He is able to do far more than we think. Then he doesn't just stop there. Not just he can do far more, but now he, to him who is able to do far more abundantly. Do you know what abundantly means? Abundantly is those waters overflowing, refreshing, renewing, satiating, satisfying in every level, and still more left. You know, when the children of Israel quit drinking and the animals quit drinking, it wasn't because it ran dry. It was because they were satisfied. That's what he's saying here, abundantly. And then he doesn't stop there. Now we have to go back to now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all. Beyond all, beyond everything, nothing is a limit. Remember, he's the creator of heaven and earth. Nothing limits our God. And then he doesn't stop there. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly, beyond all that we can ask, or above, above all that we ask, okay? Everything I can ask for, he is so far beyond that he's given me word after word after word just encouraging me reach go you know there's no limit here and then he doesn't stop there he adds on another phrase now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think wow how many are in here how many things do we have one's to him two is he's able three is to do four is to do far more Five is to do abundantly. Six is to do beyond all that we ask. Seven is to be the uh, all we ask or think. We've got seven different layers. 
each one I see taking us higher and higher and higher and higher. And then how he's able to do all that according to the power that works within us, inside of us. Who is that? That's the Holy Spirit. That means I don't have to muster it up. I don't have to grow muscles, Eddie <laughs> or Roger. <laughs> I don't have to try to figure it out beyond what I can even ask or think, beyond my ability. It's not me. It is him who is in me. That's the one who does all of this according to the glory that is in Christ Jesus, that's in our Messiah, Yeshua. All I can say to that is hallelujah. It is you, Lord. It is you alone. And I am just the great receiver of all that you have freely given to me to lift me up, to bring me through, to enable me, to take me to these new heights. And then I remind you, he doesn't do this for you to just stay put. Yeah, enjoy it, bask in it. But he does it that you might take it out and comfort others, help others with it. Launch out, take it out, go, and don't be afraid. He is with you on every level. More than you could ask or think. More than you could know or need. He is. Okay, my favorite word ineffable <laughs> he's beyond all that i've said in my last closing comment all i have done for us in this past hour is scratch the surface of my great god hallelujah yes. take it to your hearts be encouraged be blessed be uplifted and know whatever your need your god is more than able Let's close it in prayer, and then I'll ask Roger to unmute so that we can share comments and encourage one another um, in, in our last moments here. But let's, let's go to him in prayer. Oh, Lord, my heart overflows with joy right now. I am satiated in you, in focusing on you, the great God, our Savior, and the Ruch HaKodesh, the Spirit within. Praise you and thank you. You are mine. I am yours. You know me intimately, and you have even called me by a special name. Lord, you're making a place for me because you want me home with you. And yet until I'm home with you, you tell me that everything I need is available beyond what I know I need. Lord, I don't even know what I need, but you do. And I thank you that no matter what the circumstances, no matter what we see, no matter what this world throws at us, Lord, I thank you that you are orchestrating it, working it in our lives, that you are telling us, launch out deeper, take it further, trust me, let go, and let God. Lord, enable each one of us to do that, and we rejoice, and we thank you. We're humbled by the fact that you love us so, that you're willing to work with mere flesh, that you see value in us, that you want us, and that you want to use us. And Lord, let it do that. Let this so buoy us up that we will be ready to explode with you, that we have to give it out. Lord, let it go out in the power of your spirit, touching the lives of those around us, that it, it does for the others what they need. Salvation to those who need salvation, found by seeing what we have, that they want it for themselves. And for those who are saved, Lord, that it encourage and uplift and and help them. Lord, we know that, that two are strong and three, that three cord brought together is even stronger. And we know that's your hand holding our hands. Lord, we thank you. May we go out in that power and that strength. May we go out in the comfort that you've given us. And may we comfort those around us, even in our isolation, Lord. Remind us to pray for those whose lives you are working on. And, and we still are in contact via phone, via Zoom, via a next door neighbor or, or the grocery store worker or whoever it is that we're in contact with still. Lord, let your light so shine that the, the children on earth see the Father in heaven and that you are glorified. Lord, thank you that you work with us, for us, in us, and through us. And Lord, I thank you that you even work in spite of us. <laughs> the, how thankful we are for the living waters that will never run dry. Praise you. Thank you for this feast, Lord. Thank you for the refreshing of your word. May our hearts be 
just rejoicing in you as we close with a great amen. Hallelujah to you be glory in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you all, each and every one. I hope it ministers to you. It certainly did to me. <laughs> Roger, can you unmute everybody, please? <coughs> everybody that could be unmuted, yeah. Oh, okay. Richard, Beatrice Richard. and Eddie, you have to unmute yourselves then. Eddie did it. Beatrice, reach for it. There you go. Okay. So okay. you all, you can make your comments. You can talk to each other. You know, we just, gonna, we just are able to put our trust in God always. In God always. Amen. In God we trust. Always. Shouldn't be on our coins only. It should be in our hearts. <laughs> yes. Amen. 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 He'll never let us down. Amen. 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 Do you know how much we love you now? I <laughs> want to say we love you. Desi, my, it's not me. You love my God in me. My heart is just sovereign now. Um, Amen. I wish, I wish I had someone to give me the scripture when I was going through my trial with my loss. Right. Because maybe I wouldn't have understood them, but I do now. Praise so God. I've been all of these scriptures yeah. that you have read. I will be on the phone probably when I'm getting off, probably an hour with my sister. I'm going to share this with her. I wrote them down and I'm going to read to her because it didn't make sense to me then, but it does. Years later, I know. And I'm hoping that she will enjoy me reading to her what the Lord, what you have said and what the Lord say in this book. Bless. That we don't have to fear. He will take care of us. Amen. He is with us always. Amen. Let's and pray. So thankful that. that you highlight Lord, this to us today. You. you know, see, that's where you make my soul sore because I came before the Lord and said, What do I share? What do yes. I give? And I vacillated on so many thoughts that until just before we started, I wasn't confident what I was sharing. So. Well, God bless you. Let's pray for you with your sister. Yes. Is Claudia, Amen. do I remember? Is Claudia no, her name? No, that's my friend. Uh, her name is Gloria. Gloria, okay. Yes. Lord God, we know that Gloria is in a very hard spot. We know that her heart is grieving, that she is really hurting. And Dosi has continually tried to be light and truth to help her. Lord, we pray that you'll prepare Gloria's heart even right now that she will be able to hear and to understand through the power of the Holy Spirit that as Dosi opens up the word of God to her, these two sisters will have a knitting of hearts of coming together the minds in your spirit that will lift her up and give her the strength that she needs to carry on one more day, that will give her that comfort that will enable her to go on one more day. That when Dosi hangs up from her, Dosi's heart will just be exploding with all you have done in both she and her sister to glorify yourself and to meet the needs as you have promised abundantly above all we can ask or think. Thank you for this opportunity. Now use Dosi, Lord, to your glory and may glory receive it well and then be able to in turn, turn and give it to you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.